uh, you've participated in what has made Tate Modern a very uh, singular and sort of memorable experience, but also in some ways you've been the uh, observer of Tate Modern and a consumer of it like anybody else. Yeah. What, what impressions have you come away with after 10 years? I think it's done extremely well actually in terms of, you know, living up to the expectations of what the Tate Modern was supposed to be. Um, but I do have my criticisms, and this is nothing um, against how popular art has become, but it can be quite extraordinary, quite a struggle to actually see anything here because it's so crowded and, you know, it's a real sort of tourist destination. People come here to meet for lunch and to play and to look, look at things sort of, but not even necessarily that seriously kind of looking at things, which is great in many ways, but there is a lack of seriousness sometimes about about the engagement with it actually. They go and they look and then they leave without necessarily having the full experience of really understanding what it is they're looking at. The turbine hall installations are what most people think of first when they think of Tate Modern. They're big and deliberately a bit provocative but people are willing to go along with them because they know other people are going along with them too. The turbine hall thing is a mass thing. The curator in charge is Sheena Wagstaff. Not only is it the sort of physical heart of the building, mm. um, but it's also kind of metaphorical heart of what the Tate Modern stands for. First of all, I think it is a high-risk prospect for any artist to engage with a Turbine Hall Commission. I mean... And because it's so big? Because it's so big, because the stakes are so high. If you fail, you've got further to fall. The other very important aspect of the Commission is that there was no way that we could anticipate the public response to what they see in the Turbine Hall. I suppose it sort of reached a, a new urgent point with Oliver Eliasson's um, The Weather Project, yeah. you know, The, the yeah, Sun. Yeah. Part of the crowd experience was the crowd looking up hundreds of feet and seeing its own reflection on a mirrored ceiling. We had never until that point had the phenomenon of people coming down that ramp, coming into the, into the main hall and lying down on the ground to locate themselves within this kind of constellation of little dots of people in the ceiling. So it wasn't part of the, the story of the object that he made, it simply happened once he'd made it? It simply happened. Olafur Eliasson's weather project branded itself on the popular imagination. It had no obvious meaning, but hundreds of thousands of people found meaning in it. In Berlin, where Eliasson is based, I take my time getting to his studio to ask him what that Tate Modern experience felt like to him, its creator. And the reason is, I've heard he's got a lot of art events going on in this city public spots around the place. Here is one. It seems to be at the whimsical end of the spectrum of meaning, a bit of old wood. Maybe it's nature randomly brought into the urban environment. I think it doesn't matter so much how I personally interpret it as that many others have probably come here and scratched their heads and tried to interpret it too. It's bringing people together that counts now in art. Very often it's about the kind of collective quality. And if you think about a museum generally, people always talk about their sort of their personal experience, the kind yeah. of the idea of that they were maybe alone in the museum, which of course is absurd because nobody's ever alone in a museum. And here with this project, I think it was, I think it's a sort of successful thing that people always say, I was there with all these people and we did this together. And yet I had a very strong personal experience. So there was a very, very unique thing for me, which was maybe the most unanticipated thing, there was a kind of a singular and a plural which was together. There was the, the idea of you know, having a personal experience and also being a part of a collective. With stuff like this, Tate Modern has become the lightning conductor for the changing values of society, what it is that people are now willing to find significant. I think they feel it is something that is 
a necessary part of their lives. You can be facile about it and say just as much as a cappuccino or whatever, but I mean, the way we live our lives in this country has changed in the last 25 years. We live in a much more public way. We're much more ready to talk to each other. We live much more on the street than we did. And I just wonder what you think, what is the key element in that change, the change of mood? It has to be the fact that people are more prepared than they were to deal with ideas in art, to deal with the way in which artists themselves are pursuing obsessions, and to set themselves the, ch the challenge of trying to understand. Tate Modern's inspired willingness to think about what a changing audience actually wants from art, which is often just to join in with a group experience, is not peculiar to Tate Modern. Modern art museums around the world have gone in for this idea of looking at how audiences relate to art and through that relate to each other. It's a trend that's even been given its own name, relational aesthetics. The French intellectual Nicolas Bourriot, who works at the French Ministry of Culture and who organises exhibitions of contemporary art, has written about a new emphasis in contemporary art where what really matters is not so much the objects of art, but people's interaction with art. That's you, the audience for art. And this is very important for the story of Tate Modern. So I'm on a train now to Paris, where I'm going to go to the Ministry of Culture and meet Burio and ask him how he assesses 10 years of Tate Modern. The big question that's, you know, raised, you know, about the last developments of culture, of the culture business today, is uh, how is it possible to keep a balance between this uh, search for bigger audiences all the time and the contents that are displayed and the uh, task, the duty of, uh, that the, the, the museums have to produce meanings and to, to, to provide keys to understand the contemporary world. Something that uh, many people will immediately associate with Tate Modern are uh, big exhibitions involving other people interactive exhibitions where we've got to do something like lie on the floor looking at a giant sunset or slide down some slides. What's the significance of those interactive exhibitions in what it is that Tate Modern is doing generally? The more we are isolated from one from another, uh, the more we need this kind of gatherings and this kind of uh, crowd experience. And the museum, of course, uh, it's, it's a place where you can have a look at something, look at something in a very deep way, and talk at the same time to your neighbor. It's uh, then totally different than the, uh, looking at a feature film or uh, going to theater or, or concert. It's, it's a place for discussions and negotiations between people towards an artwork. So it's a kind of triangular, you know, uh, uh, situation all the time. And the museum is the third part of this triangle. The artwork, the people, yeah. the museum. Yeah. The large scale of the Turbine Hall exhibitions is one thing. Their popularity is very significant. What fallout has that had on other museums? This spectacular, popular, very noticeable events on a giant scale. I think the Turbine Hall program uh, invented a, a format for uh, presenting contemporary art and it, it introduced, I would say, a, a, a new uh, scale for contemporary art. And uh, what can you ask to an, to an institution uh, if not, you know, producing new scales, new, new formats for, uh, for presenting art? Tate Modern is famous for being successful a mass audience comes to see art that is itself often massive. It raises the problem of the quality of this success. If hundreds of thousands of people are having goony fun with art, you'd have to be some kind of spoil sport to complain. But does that mean you can't at least wonder if hugeness, visitor numbers, the size of the art, if hugeness is the only criterion for success? Everyone has their impressions of what Tate Modern is about, what it means. And on the surface of it, because the rating story of Tate Modern is so successful, those impressions must be